WHPR TV is now on demand. Catch us when you want, how you want, where you want. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Watch your favorite TV shows on demand. And be sure to download the WHPR app. We're now on demand at your demand. WHPR TV Detroit on demand.com. A Watkins Broadcasting Company. You've seen him with MJ. He was the defense attorney in the case of the century with O.J. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant, Orenthal James Simpson, not guilty of the crime of murder in violation of Penal Code Section 187A, a felony upon Nicole Brown Simpson, a human being, as charged in count one of the information. Now, check him out with Detroit's own R.J. Is it true that you're thinking about or... Uh, investigating the, the possibility of, of being part of the gambling industry. Attorney Johnny Cochran. The, the Simpson case did not create the divide in this country. What it, did, what it did was expose the divide. It's what it did. You see, it showed us that how two Americans, one black and one white, could see the same evidence and see it differently based upon our life experiences. Tonight's special guest on Late Night Entertainment with R.J. Watkins. It's arrogance. That happens, you know. And it's power, power corrupts. People get arrogant, and so, you know, you have, that's what happens. Johnny Cochran, tonight's special guest on Late Night Entertainment. We'll be right back after this. 107.3 FM, WVIE. How would you like for this to be you? Well, it could be. If you have the desire to be an independent radio personality, paying yourself, this is your chance. WVIE 107.3 FM and WHPR 88.1 FM are looking for people with outgoing personalities who can attract sponsors. Launch your career on a radio station with the latest technology and broadcasting. WVIE 107.3 and WHPR 88.1. If you're into talk, R&B, oldies, jazz, gospel, or soca, Radio We Can See is where you need to be. 88.1 FM. WHPR. Have your own radio show. We have block time available. Call 313-868-6612. Radio We Can See. Broadcasting live in the Virgin Islands and Detroit. Comcast Cable 91, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Have you ever wanted your own TV show? Have you dreamed of showcasing your talent for the world to see? Well, now you can. Have your own TV show. For only $99, you can have your own 30-minute show. Not only will you be seen in the Detroit area, but you can be viewed worldwide. Be seen on WHPR Detroit Live, Comcast Cable Channel 91, on the web at tv33whpr.com, with the TV33 app, on Roku, Google TV, Apple TV, and on Amazon Fire TV. Act now. Time slots are limited. Sign up today and get a free replay with the purchase of your time slot. For more information, call 313-868-6612. Visit our studios and receive a free TV interview to promote your business, church, or organization by appointment only. R.J. Watkins here on Late Entertainment with a very special guest, a very special friend. In the studio we have... Mr. Johnny Cochran, how you doing, sir? It's a real pleasure. My pleasure being with you. Uh, it feels as though we know you because we've seen you so much on television, uh, radio, uh, media. Um, but this is not new for you. No, no, it's not. Uh, I've been out here for a long time. I've been practicing law for 34 years and, of course, um, very familiar with Detroit. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm part of the Atwater group here uh, mm -hmm. with Larry Doss and um, some other citizens here, and I've been here several times. I was here earlier this year at the um, Greater Hartford Baptist Church uh, with uh, the great uh, Dr. Adams. So okay. I love Detroit. Now, you are not only a lawyer, but you're a business man. It, are, is it true that you're thinking about or uh, investigating the, the possibility of, of being part of the gambling in Detroit? Yes, yes, we are. In fact, early on, uh, we, I got involved with uh, Herb Strother and um, Nellie Varner, along with uh, Larry Doss and the Atwater. Um, 
I'm looking forward to uh, the, now that the uh, initiative has been passed, mm -hmm. looking forward to being an active party in the community. I certainly hope the idea that got me involved was the economic benefit to Detroit and the fact that African Americans and other minorities could have a viable part in this whole thing. So I'm certainly hoping that those promises will be kept. You know, once the big boys come in and money starts flowing, sometimes we forget those promises. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm certainly hopeful that it'll mean something to this community. That, that's the only reason I'm really interested in the whole project. Okay. Now, because, you know, I was thinking, um, you are involved in one of the biggest cases in, uh, in, 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 in the world, United States, um, maybe. I think the only thing I could say that got a lot of publicity when I was a little guy growing up is the Kennedy assassination, if to, to talk about the, the publicity on that. Um, this is one of the biggest cases uh, in media cases. Yeah, it really has turned out that way. I've never seen anything quite like it. In fact, uh, I didn't anticipate that, of course. I don't think anybody really anticipated the amount of media attention. And, and of course, the controversy about it. You know, the, the Kennedy assassination and the, and the Dreyfus case. It's one of those cases where people talk about it forever. And I, I imagine there'll be years, down the years, people will be talking about the Simpson case and still debating it and debating the results. Especially, this is a unique case because you're going to have not only the criminal case where he was acquitted, but you're going to have now the civil case where the jury will someday reach a verdict. And so, uh, depending on what that verdict is, there'll be even more debate. Then, of course, there's the question about whether he gets his children back. So it, it just goes on and on and on. And you know, people are taking this, I mean, they're taking it um, personal. Uh, they're taking it uh, to heart, and people are really um, falling out about the case. They're very, very emotional. You see, um, R.J., the, the Simpson case did not create the divide in this country. What it, it, what it did was expose the divide. It's what it did. You see, it showed us that how two Americans, one black, one white, could see the same evidence and see it differently based upon our life experiences, based upon our, our, our contact with how we grew up. And, and, you know, it doesn't make either side right or wrong. But certainly for a people who, who love America, African Americans, justice system hasn't always worked for, yeah. for African Americans. And for them to see someone who looks like them who can get some measure of justice, you know, that was cause for some uh, celebration. That does not in any way denigrate the fact that two people lost their lives. Exactly. And, and we're very, very serious about that. Exactly. And in fact, any celebration wasn't so much even about O.J. Simpson. It was about the system having worked finally. You know, finally, you had 12 people who listened only to the facts, listened and got the law, and didn't have to worry about these pontificating pundits and rendered a decision. Now, that is justice in America. You know, I'm a victim because my father was murdered at his, at his store. And um, three young men came to the store one day and, and murdered him. And one walked, which was the guy that did not come into the store. And to see how the justice system works, sure. even though we know he was involved, we know that he was a part of the plan, but he did not walk into the store. Yes. And the other two gentlemen did not say, yes, he knew about it. Yes, yes. He walked. And so, like I said, I'm a victim, so I, I could, my, my heart goes out to the victim, to the Browns. And certainly you can you understand, understand that. But still yet, we have to acknowledge the system. That's right. It, the system is in place. And you know what? The thing that's so interesting about so many Americans, they never talk about changing the system with cases like, let's say, William Kennedy Smith. The jury comes back in 70 minutes. John DeLorean is acquitted. They don't talk about changing the system. Klaus Van Bulow is acquitted. They make a movie about it. Only when O.J. Simpson is acquitted, because he has the resources to fight, people talk about changing the system. You don't change the system over any one case. You know, the, you just, you deal with it and you go on. It's not about a popularity contest, as you said. And there are aberrations and, and things that happen, uh, such, as your, such as your case. And, and the things that are so emotional about it. And certainly as a people, African Americans, we're very sensitive to being victims. We've been victims a whole lot in the society. Mm -hmm. So we certainly understand that. But we also understand the overall workings of how the system does work for everybody. Is there something you could change about the case or something that you could rewrite or restructure? What would it be, how would you do it? Oh, I think if I, looking back on it, a couple of things. I think, number one, how the jury has been treated. Uh, I think it's outrageous. I mean, you take these, these 14 people, 12 plus two alternates, uh, they gave up over a year of their lives. Under California law, they got $5 a day. They were sequestered. They were locked away from their families for a whole year. They did what Abraham Lincoln calls the highest act of citizenship, is jury service, and they got roundly criticized. I think that's one of the things. I think we ought, how we deal with our jurors and the respect we give them as triers of fact. I think we ought to talk about it, and somebody ought to do something about that. I mean, they should be paid more, and I think people should be very, very restrained in the comments. You, you can't go talk about a judge like that. So these people are judges of the facts, so why would that be allowed? That's one thing. For my own personal thing, I wouldn't change much. I probably would change one thing in my closing argument, uh, RJ. I think that the, the anecdote with regard to Hitler and Furman 
what I was trying to indicate, which I seem to be pretty clear to me, was that all that is required is for evil to triumph, is for good men to remain silent. It's a quote from Sir Edmund Burke. It came to me in a recommendation from a Jewish lawyer who'd lost family in Auschwitz, in, 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 the, in the Holocaust. So I wasn't trying to trivialize the Holocaust at all. We got criticized for that, primarily by Mr. Goldman, and I understand he's the victim, and so I never responded. Mm -hmm. And so that was hurtful because um, it was portrayed as we're being insensitive to the Holocaust, and that was the furthest thing from the truth. It wasn't necessary for the argument, so if I had to do it all again, I probably would not um, include that in. That's probably the one thing I would change. Okay. Okay. The book, Journey to Justice, how did it come about? Well, what happened was, I didn't want to write just another Simpson book. There have been so many Simpson books. So many people jumping on the bandwagon talking about uh, the Simpson case. And quite frankly, as was um, the lead lawyer, I was very mindful of my responsibility not to breach the attorney-client privilege. I wasn't going to talk about anything that was uh, attorney-client privilege, anything that happened involving the client, you know, behind the scenes. I didn't think it was appropriate. I could talk about the lawyers and how we got along and that sort of thing, and, and I could talk about strategies and things. So I thought it might be appropriate because I didn't want to be defined by others. I wanted people to hopefully understand that I was here before Simpson uh, working and trying cases and I'm going to be here after Simpson. So I made it an autobiography mm -hmm. where I got a chance to talk about my, my faith in God and, and my, my love of family and about what it means to be an advocate. So many of these lawyers were running and hiding and on shifting sands and stuff like that. I want to talk about what it means to be an advocate. It's not a popularity contest. I wasn't trying to win friends and influence people. I was trying to represent my client to the best of my ability. There wasn't any political context to this about, you know, what, what are the ramifications of this. My job was to defend my client and any lawyer would want to do that. So I wanted to put that in perspective and, and, and try to bring all those things together. It also was about all these battles I've had over the years with the LAPD. You know, I grew up in Los Angeles and my practice has been largely uh, handling police misconduct cases. So all those things come together. And, and finally, RJ, it was in, in the 15th chapter. It's about uh, how we get along in this country beyond the Simpson verdict. The 15th chapter is entitled A Duty of Conversation. And it talks about how important it is for us to come together and talk about things. You see in this country, uh, Du Bois said this in 1903, that the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line and how we get along. And he was right. The only problem is it's going to be the problem of the 21st century because in America, people want to deal with the, with the problem of the color line and how we get along with the whole concept of denial. They deny it exists. And denial is no cure. So I talk about that. We need to talk about this. This don't ask, don't tell policy needs to stop. We need some moral leadership where somebody has courage to speak and say, look, we do see things differently sometimes, but there's a lot more that unites us than divides us in this country. Okay, we're going to take a station break. Late Night Entertainment will continue with more after this. Don't go away. Watkins Broadcasting is going worldwide. Now you can watch Detroit's own WHPR on your TV from anywhere in the world. No matter where you are, you can stay in the know with WHPR TV and Roku. You can get your easy-to-install Roku box from wherever you shop for your entertainment gear. Once your Roku box is connected to your TV and internet, go to the channel store on the home menu of the Roku box. Enter WHPR TV in the search engine and add it to your channels. That's it. That's all you need to get the best in entertainment, news, and talk no matter where you are. Roku brings all of your favorites to your TV. Netflix, Hulu Plus, Crackle, HBO Go, and now WHPR TV, Detroit Live. WHPR TV is now on demand. Catch us when you want, how you want, where you want. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Watch your favorite TV shows on demand. And be sure to download the WHPR app. We're now on demand at your demand. WHPR TV Detroit on demand.com. A Watkins Broadcasting Company. We're back on Late Night Entertainment, R.J. Watkins here with a very special guest in the studio, Johnny Cochran. Johnny, you're also great friends with uh, Michael Jackson. Yes, yes, we're, we're very close. Had the pleasure of representing him, as you know, and we maintain, we've been very, very close. In fact, I got his, um, I don't even handle divorces, but I got his divorce and... Um... You don't, wait, wait, you, you don't handle divorces, <laughs> but you, 
<laughs> got a, oh, oh, his first? Yeah, it, from, from Lisa, from, uh, from Lisa Marie oh, Presley. Oh, uh, yeah. Presley. Yeah, I, I did handle that. I, it's one of those things that you, sometimes you do things you don't normally do. <laughs> and I did that. Was that interesting? It was very interesting, very interesting. Two people, two, two very substantial people. So it was interesting. But we, we remained very close. I mean, I, it was a real pleasure representing Michael. I think that he's an extremely talented young man. Mm -hmm. and, and, and by and large, misunderstood by many. But he's extremely talented and generous and, and really a pleasure to be around. Uh, because of my involvement on the writing the book and the book tour, we haven't been able to see, much, see each other much lately. But I'm going to see him on New Year's Eve, he's performing way across the ocean. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to join him on New Year's Eve. He's got a special performance. I'm going to go over and see him. And he's coming to um, his one on this world tour. The only place in America he's going to be coming in Hawaii on January 3rd and 4th. So I'm going to okay. see, see him New Year's Eve in one, on one of those shows. How does one, or how does Johnny Cochran have the celebrities hire him or want to call him? Or uh, how does it work? How do they get to you? How do you get to them? Yeah. It's an, interesting, it's an interesting thing. What you do is, and with me, and quite frankly, you know, we'll talk about the MJs and talk about the OJs, and I'm close with them, but, but, but my career really has been built on the no Jays, as we call them, you know, people you never heard of. And those are the ones who, they're with me, good time and bad times. But what happened if, if sometimes you have represented the no Jays for a long time and, and you, you've done a fairly good job, people will call you. How I got referred to Michael Jackson was when he had this, these allegations against him. It was December 1st. I never will forget the day. Uh, my receptionist called me and said, um, Elizabeth Taylor's on the phone. I said, what Elizabeth Taylor? She said, the Elizabeth Taylor. And so it was interesting. And at that time, she called and said, listen, you've been referred to me to represent my friend. And she went on to tell me the circumstance. I said, can you come to my house? That was on a Wednesday. Come to my house on, on Friday, December 3rd. It was 1993. And I said, yeah, I can be there. And so, uh, sure enough, I was in town. I was there. Went up, and that's, that was the beginning of it. Michael wasn't even in the United States at that point. So I started representing him. And with other people, you know, living in Los Angeles, um, or Todd Bridges would just call, or, or Jim Brown, or Lou Rawls, or somebody like that. They would just call O.J. Simpson. I knew, you know, from around Los Angeles. So, uh, so well, I guess my question was really, how could I, if I needed a, if I needed a Johnny Cochran? Sure. Number one, could I afford it? Yes. I don't think so. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, RJ. You could afford it. Yes, you could. And you know, it depends upon the kind of case. Obviously, yeah. You just just call me. And what we're doing now is, you know, we, we try to be selective on the kind of cases we handle. But at the same time, now, you John, know, you heard him say I could call. Well, absolutely, he's absolutely. Not absolutely. Call absolutely. <laughs> you got it. You got it. You know, we try to be selective on, on the cases. But but at the same time, you know, if it's something that's intriguing and something we're interested in, oh yeah, that's what happens. Okay. Just call him. We, we just might, start we, we might have something that you might be interested right. in. Okay, good. Tell me about the book. Let's get back to the book. Sure. Um, you have, you're a very religious guy. Yes, yes. I think that was one of the things that I wanted to really point out. You know, my roots uh, run back across the continent mm -hmm. from, from Los Angeles, California to Shreveport, Louisiana to the, really the, the earliest days of my life. I can remember we lived on a street called Milam Avenue and my mother taking us by the hand. We walked from our house to the Little Union Baptist Church. And we had one of the greatest pastors in this country. He still preaches. His name is Caesar Clark, Caesar Arthur Walter Clark, C.A.W. Clark. He's in the Good Street Baptist Church in Dallas now. And I, I first learned about the gospel from him. In the book, I talk about this in the first chapter. I said, when I was young, I thought everybody was black and Baptist, and the food was always fried. And that's how I started. And from that point on, and that's been with me ever since. And, and a strong family. My mother and father were there for us. And they always told us, you know, about being the best we could be. I mean, that was a real hallmark. I mean, they said, look, you know, there's Jim Crow, there's all this discrimination, but you, you know, you, you do the best you can, and things will work out. And, you know, and one of the things that I think young people now should pay attention, because education is the key still is to listen to what the parents said. We did that in those days. Yes. You know? oh, you and, and, it, and it paid off. You did what mother and father said, right? <laughs> you know, I still do. You know, and, 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 that's, and we still do. My father still lives with me. And so right. so right. it really is a big thing, you know. And, that, mm -hmm. and that's the kind of faith that, that you and I know, mm -hmm. we were talking about this, that we have to go forward with. I mean, you, in your life, and the projects and the vision that you have, uh, the projects you're working on, you have to have faith, you know. It's good to know that um, you have a religious background. Oh, yeah. yeah I believe it's the faith that no matter what happens, no matter how dark the hours become, we always know there's going to be a brighter tomorrow. And, you know, the book, I mean, you talk about faith. In the book, I end actually the book with uh, my mother's favorite song. And it's something that's become kind of, a, uh, kind of a hallmark of things for me as I go into the future. And it's hold to God's unchanging hand. And that means an awful lot to me. You know, to, to the words go like, time is built on swift transition. Not of earth unmoved can stand. Build your 
hopes on things eternal, hold to God's unchanging hand. If you do that, everything else is going to be all right. Yeah. You got to see it through every, every time. time. Right. Every That's time, every time. What, what's, what's next for you, John? What, what do you want to do that you haven't done? Yet? Well, you know, you travel I, the world. Yeah. It's interesting. Well, I'm going to do uh, a couple of new things. Besides, I, I get, wanna, you, besides get you a video wall. <laughs> I'll get a video wall like that. I love that, you know. <laughs> I want to, um, you know, I want to keep practicing law. I'm, that's really my first love. Mm -hmm. But now I, I signed a new deal with uh, with Court TV, starting on January 13th. Oh. I'm going to have my own show. I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do a little of what you do. I'm gonna have um, <laughs> a show called Cochran and Grace. It's gonna be a, a talk show each evening. The my co-anchor is a, um, a, a prosecutor from Atlanta, Georgia, who claims she's never lost a case, and she's a she's a fiery lady and and and, and, and very 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 good. And we're gonna have, we're gonna be emanating from New York four nights a week. It'll be topic driven. So if the topic today is Bosnia, we'll be dealing with Bosnia with, with guests and also um, uh, call-ins. And we're going to be doing that from live. New York. Live, 10 o'clock each evening, Court TV. And then I'll be doing that. Um, what and network? Then, uh, it'll be Court TV. Oh, Court TV and, yeah, network. Court TV and then that okay. network. And so, and hopefully uh, I'm going to enjoy that. And then when I'm, when I'm in trial in Los Angeles, I'll do the show from, from L.A. So uh, I'll sounds be like, huh? by, by coastal, and so it's going to be interesting. I'm going to give it a shot and see how, see how it works out. That sounds interesting. Yeah, interesting. That sounds yeah, interesting. Yeah. Maybe we could run some clips or some outtakes on our, on our station here. On well, 60, I, I don't know if they, if yeah, they, if I'm they sure, I'm sure we can work something. I'd love to try to do that. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk yeah. about that. We're going to take a station break. And late night, we'll tune with more after this. Don't go away. Have you ever wanted your own TV show? Have you dreamed of showcasing your talent for the world to see? Well, now you can. Have your own TV show. For only $99, you can have your own 30-minute show. Not only will you be seen in the Detroit area, but you can be viewed worldwide. Be seen on WHPR Detroit Live, Comcast Cable Channel 91, on the web at tv33whpr.com, with the TV33 app, on Roku, Google TV, Apple TV, and on Amazon Fire TV. Act now. Time slots are limited. Sign up today and get a free replay with the purchase of your time slot. For more information, call 313-868-6612. Visit our studios and receive a free TV interview to promote your business, church, or organization by appointment only. We're back on Late Night with RJ here. Johnny, the way O.J. has been treated, what are your comments about that? How, how do you feel? Uh, you know, I have a lot of concern about that. I mean, I think that in America, you know, uh, we're, we're taught as young people, you know, about fundamental fairness and that um, if, you, if you play by the rules and you, you do the right thing, that things will work out. You know, in this instance, uh, that hasn't been true. We play by the rules and, of course, he was acquitted and it's been very, very, very tough for him. I mean, he's been a pariah by a lot of people, especially in the majority community. The African-American community, by and large, has been pretty supportive. They accept, you know, accept the jury's verdict and move on. And, and I am particularly troubled because, you know, R.G., if you think about it, um, there's still a lot of racism alive and well in America. And, you know, we don't go around looking for racism at every turn, but there are certain examples. And one of the things that, that is intriguing to me is this. If you look at how the, the media and the press and the majority community deals with the two young men who are charged with the Oklahoma City bombings, now consider those, consider that act. That is probably, that is the um, worst act of domestic terrorism in the history of this country. Right. And yet, uh, and I'm not yeah. prejudging these two young right. men, there's very little said about those, there's, there's no outrage about the, the, at least these two alleged young people. Or take the Unabomber, the alleged Unabomber. Uh, the, the press writes about this, um, this alleged Unabomber in reverent terms, as though how brilliant he was to escape <laughs> for, for 18 years and to write this manifesto that they had to publish. And you know, now, just think about that. Or think about this just recently. The situation where um, uh, this, this CIA person was charged with treason in his own country. You know, sound like your own country. Now, you imagine how the press deals with those things. And imagine, look, look at the, the treatment of O.J. Simpson. And I have to say, it has something to do with race. Uh, because you see, in this country, whenever there's any allegation of a black man involved with a white woman in any way, um, it just brings to mind 
the, the days of Emmett Till and things like that. You know, that's the picture that it conjures up. And, and it's so unfortunate. And we need to get beyond that. I mean, I mean, justice should be the same for everyone, it seems to me. So uh, hopefully, you know, by talking about it, people will take a look at their views and say, you know, why, 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 do, I, why, am I, why do I feel this way? Why am I uh, being this way? Why do I treat this, this one case over here differently than I do someone else? So I, I've been troubled by it, and I have spoken out about it. You know, I think that, I think that you, we, should, we need to put that out on the table so people get concerned about it, because I think we should be able to move on with our lives. Finally, I mean, there is enough in this country. We've got to be talking about how we uh, make the society a place where we spend more money on education than we do on incarceration and then worrying about a case that's over with, you know, the mm -hmm. criminal case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, Furman, when, how did you get the research to, to find the tape? Well, you know, as you may or may not know, RJ, I'm, I'm, I'm a big believer of cameras in the courtroom because I think, number one, it helped us out immeasurably. And I didn't want to just trust the press to tell us what was going on. And you could see for yourself. I mean, the glove demonstration would be the best example. If the press told you about the glove demonstration, they said things like, well, O.J. Simpson was acting. Well, that's baloney. Um, he's not that good an actor, but I mean, you know, the best <laughs> so at least if you saw it yourself, you were able to make that determination. But more important than that, by virtue of the, because the case was on television, that's how we knew so much about this man. When I first got on the case, a lady named Kathleen Bell wrote, sent a, sent a fax to my office, sent the same one to the prosecution, saying, look, I don't even like O.J. Simpson or care about the case, but let me tell you something, this guy, Furman, is dangerous. I met him, and in the first meeting, he used the N-word like it was saying good day. And he said, and he also said if he saw a black man driving down the street with a white woman, he would think of a way to make, to stop them. And he thought that all black people should be put together and burned and bombed. Now, you know, that's genocidal racism. And so, right about, so they told us all that. From that, we got his um, psychological background where in 1981, he told the LAPD, he told his superiors, he said, you know, I, I, I can't I hate blacks, I hate browns, I hate women, I hate everybody. Get me out of the field. And they said, no, no, no. <laughs> You're the kind of guy we want to get back out there. That's why he's still on this case. He wanted to retire. So we all knew about this guy. But television really provides us with the tapes. You know, God works in mysterious ways, R.J. Mm -hmm. When That's Bailey was cross-examining him and asked him, had you used, remember those famous words, are you saying, detective, that you call no black person the N-word in the last 10 years? That is from 1985 to 1995. Is that what you're saying? And he said, That's what I'm saying, sir. Then all of a sudden, one day I go back to my office and a lawyer calls and says, you know, I've got a client who lives in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, who has Mr. Furman on tape, and you need to hear these tapes, because they saw it on television. So, you know, I love Tamers in the courtroom. So I went, that was the first day I missed the trial. I went to Winston-Salem, North Carolina. I heard these tapes. Man, the rest of Americans heard these tapes. It is chilling. You don't allow two little incidents. There were more than 70 incidents. This man talking about planning stuff, beating people to a pulp. Uh, Why would lie. someone put that on tape? Well, he was talking to her about a screenplay she was working on, but he was telling her how it really is to be a cop. I said that we would lie. He said we beat these guys so badly in one instance. And he allowed her to tape it. Let her tape it. That's how. That's how arrogance. <laughs> arrogance. <laughs> Why would in Texaco would they put this on tapes for his minutes? Because they're arrogant. They don't think anybody can ever just tell them what to do. It's arrogance. And that happens. You know, and power, surface. power corrupts. And people get arrogant, and so you know you have. To, that's what happens. How did OJ feel? What do you think? Your thoughts, OJ? Did he make a lot of stars? Um, well, have a lot of stars came, or a lot of people become wealthy from this incident? No, oh, yeah, I think you know, I think he has some concern about that. I mean, everybody's become wealthy. I mean, I think you know, is one of the times he's spoken out. You can tell he. Uh, well, you just take this fellow Geraldo. I mean, oh every my night goodness. there's a show That's about O.J. Simpson. <laughs> and you know, he's got an O.J. fixation, man. Why? An O.J. obsession. Because if he doesn't have O.J. Simpson as a subject matter, he loses 40% of his viewers in the first five minutes. That's why. So when there was not even a civil trial, he talks about O.J. But yet when O.J. comes out with a video to try to replenish the resources that he lost in trying to defend himself, they said, well, don't, don't buy this tape. Same people who are making all this money off him. No, I don't think that's fair either. So, you know, so I, I think obviously with some justification, he has some concern about it. Everybody else has done well except him. He's still out there struggling, going through these cases, trying to get his children back. But I think that I predict that he is going to get his children back in the very, very near future. Okay. Near future. Anybody else would have them back already. You and a couple of the lawyers that worked on the case understand if you are not talking or not the best of <laughs> friends? Or? Well, well, RJ, you know, you know, in the Bible it teaches you to turn the other cheek and love your brother. And I, and I always want to love my brother. And, uh, clearly, it's hard sometimes. It, it, sometimes it's more difficult. <laughs> sometimes it requires more Christianity than ever. What happened was 
all of us, except for maybe in two instances, are very, very close. The, the, only, the one glaring example is Robert Shapiro. He basically uh, turned his back on us, and turned his back not so much on us, but on his clan. That interview he gave to Barbara Walters the day before the verdict came out was, was a betrayal, you know, of all of us, and, you know, and quite frankly, a betrayal of his clan. And so we is, have a little problem legal? with him. Is that legal? Can he uh, talk Well, about? he could do it, but it was, he thought the case was over. He thought we were going to lose, too, see. Uh, but he was wrong on both counts. And so, uh, but he was on shifting sands all along. He, he didn't know which side he was going to be on. And it was, we were always troubled by him. So we had to kind of isolate him. We, we knew who he was. And he was taping, he was, I caught him taping our meetings back in the lockup with Simpson. So uh, the red light on in his pocket, a lawyer taping your own meetings on the same team. So we had to be very careful. You know, we, had to, we couldn't talk about certain things in meetings where he was. Mm. So we knew who he was. He was writing his book the last two or three months of the thing. So you have to just deal with the people the way you are. But we had enough sense to know that if you have someone who you can't trust, and who knows has been privy to a lot of your strategy, you better keep him close there to the end rather than let him get out there right. and everybody will know it. <laughs> the book, before we wrap up the book, uh, interesting, uh, educational, informative, um, special. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, what are your words to Detroit uh, for those upcoming lawyers, for those who would like to be a Johnny Cochran? Well, you know, I think that for all of us, for for for, uh, for upcoming lawyers and for um, kids, just kids out there who are watching your program who are still up tonight. Uh, in this country, uh, there's, there's only one Michael Jordan, only one <laughs> Grant Hill. We can't slam dunk, uh, run for a touchdown, or have the moves of Barry Sanders, only one Barry Sanders. But there can be lots of Johnny Cochran's if you work hard, if you believe in what you're doing, uh, put your faith in God, put your hand in his hand, and believe in yourself. Yeah, you can be a Johnny Cochran. You can be an RJ. You can, you can do what we do. And that's a lot more realistic. You can control your own destiny for the future. That's what I believe. Very well said. Thank Very you. well spoken. RJ Wagenson, thank you. Thank you for coming by, taking time out. My brother, my brother. And we love you, guy. Thank you, my brother. All my right. pleasure. Thank you. Good night. Late night. We out of here. Your radio is now on TV. Your TV is now on radio. WHPR 88.1 FM can now be heard and seen worldwide. The same platform that hosts all of your favorite content now has WHPR TV and radio. Have your own radio or TV show on Roku with approximately 8 million homes starting as low as $50. Debut your music video, clothing line, church ministry, plays, or products. A limited number of slots are available, so act now. For more information, visit RokuDetroit.com or call 313-868-6612. You heard about it. Now come be a part of it. Roku Detroit Worldwide. Approximately 8 million viewers. WHPR-TV is now on demand. Catch us when you want, how you want, where you want. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Watch your favorite TV shows on demand. And be sure to download the WHPR app. We're now on demand at your demand. WHPR-TV Detroit on demand.com. A Watkins Broadcasting Company.